All right, if you got your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Genesis chapter 2. In a lot of ways, the Bible is a pretty straightforward book. It starts in the beginning and ends with Amen. And in a lot of ways, it is deeply complicated. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, I really want to talk about the theme of miraculous births. And typically we talk about Jesus' miraculous birth and really just leave the story there. Um, but there are so many in the Bible. And the first one, of course, is Adam. Now, we get a lot of comparisons in the Bible of Jesus to Adam. Paul, in his speech to the Athenians, talks about Jesus as the new Adam and <clears throat> talks the same way to the Galatians. He tells them about, he, he compares Jesus and Adam. But we also find this in the Gospels. Luke and Matthew, of course, have the theme of miraculous birth, but in John, it goes deeper than that because John starts his gospel in the beginning there was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God so when we read Genesis we're looking for Jesus in this very first story now this first story has a few I mean very common mythological elements you have God creating Adam out of clay and then breathing the breath of life into his nostrils. And in a way, this is like the creation of an idol to the God because uh, idols are made of clay and God creates humanity and it says God made humanity in God's image. And then God ins installs this new idol in his temple in the Garden of Eden. And tells Adam, watch over the garden. Take care of it. Take care of all these wonderful plants and animals I've created for you. So we have the miraculous birth. We have, of course, the river, the, the river running through Eden, and there are two trees with some wonderful powers. One is the tree of life, which imparts immortality, and the other is the tree of the garden, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And we see these two trees in mythology, but I'm going to focus on the tree of life here. <clears throat> because the tree of life we see in quite a few uh, stories one is the peach trees of Chinese mythology which grow peaches every 3,000 years and if you eat those peaches you will live for 3,000 years and every culture that has a tree of life is very similar. They all have a time limit. That is to say, you must always eat of the fruit of the tree of life if you're going to live forever. And that's what we see here in the Garden of Eden. Because... In chapter 2 verse 16 it says and the Lord God commanded Adam you are free to eat from any tree in the garden but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil for when you eat of it you will certainly die now is that what happens to Adam does he eat of that does he die when he eats of that fruit and is God saying that the fruit is somehow poisonous? Or is God saying that eating of the fruit is punishable by death? 
But we know it's not poisonous, because Adam doesn't die. In fact, he lives almost a thousand years after eating of the fruit. And I wonder if the tree of life then is meant to be like these other trees of life in mythology, where we must constantly eat of the fruit. Because when God cuts Adam off from eating of the fruit anymore, that's when he starts to die. Now when we compare this to Jesus, Jesus is born mortal. He's born fully human, right? We're told he's human in every way. Maybe I'm straining that a bit to make the comparison, but bear with me. But his teachings, all right, his knowledge of good and evil lead to eternal life, right? He dies on the cross. He, he lives a life that is fully mortal, and in resurrection and in his ascension, he becomes immortal. What about Adam? Adam is the exact opposite of this. Adam starts out immortal and falls from grace. He can no longer eat of the tree of life because of what he's done. Jesus, because of what he's done, becomes immortal. Now, yes, once again, using the language of comparison here, so please try not to take things too literally. Um, But there's one way in which they overlap completely, and that is the act of forgiveness. You see, just like I said, Adam eats of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, but he doesn't die. There are those who say that this is the first commandment, and that it is punishable by death, and it is so strange that God doesn't punish Adam. But is it a commandment? When we look in Genesis chapter 4, we see something very similar. We see something that definitely is a commandment. Because once Adam and Eve are cast out of the Garden of Eden, their goal is to get back. Their goal for their entire life is to fix what they've done. And we know that because of the example of Cain and Abel. Now remember that Adam was appointed to watch over the garden, to take care of all the plants and animals. So when we see his two sons, Abel taking care of the animals and Cain taking care of the plants, doing what God commanded their father to do, they're trying to get back to that right relationship with God. Did God forgive Adam? Is that what happened? We know that God is still speaking. They're not completely out of relationship with God yet. Because God says to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. And we know what happens next. Cain doesn't rule over it. Cain falls from grace, just as his father did. He murders his brother Abel. And God once again forgives. Because we know that murder in the Torah, we know that it is a sin who, which is punishable by death. But does God expect us to punish murderers? Does he expect executions to be carried out? Well, God doesn't carry out that execution. He says to Cain, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Abel 
Abel's blood cries out for justice. And justice, that standard, is that Cain be executed for his crime against his brother. But God doesn't deliver justice. This same God that we are told is the Word, the Word that was with God, the Word that was God, the Word that was made flesh. This is the God that forgives Cain. But Cain has broken this relationship with his family. He can't remain part of his family after having done this. So God exiles Cain, just like Adam could not remain in right relationship with God after eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So Cain cannot re remain in right relationship with his family after murdering his brother. Now, these don't look like the same thing at all. Adam ate fruit from a tree. Cain murdered his brother. One of these things is not like the other. Yeah, I get that. And this should be obvious to every reader. This is highly allegorical. But it shows us how through our actions, we make it impossible to enter into right relationship with God. And God keeps calling people. If you keep reading in Genesis, you see all the way to Noah, God is calling people. And when Noah is the last person on earth to listen to God, he says, I'm going to wipe away everyone else. And it's just going to be Noah. And we're going to try to do this thing all over again. And what happens? We do this thing all over again. We separate, we fracture, we become nations. And in Genesis chapter, I want to say chapter 10, we have what's called the Table of Nations, and it's the family tree from Noah to Abraham as what was one family walking and talking with God. And then once again, one family walking and talking with God becomes separate, fractured nations that forget their God. And this was the vision of God that humanity walk and talk in the garden with God and take care of this world that we love. When Jesus is compared to Adam, this is the point of overlap, forgiveness. Because that is the mechanism through which Jesus saves humanity over and over again, from Adam to Cain to Noah to Abraham. And Abraham, once again, walks and talks with God. It's said that Abraham was righteous because he lived by faith. And when Abraham's descendants go to Egypt, And they once again need deliverance. God sends one more miraculous birth. He sends Moses. And Moses helps restore that relationship to the na nation of Israel. But Israel enters Canaan and loses its way. And they say, God, send us a king. Send us a king who will lead us like all the other nations because we don't want to be. We don't want to exist as the nation you envisioned us to be, led directly by you, God. We want a king. Let our king lead us. And so God sends King David. But of course, King David 
is <clears throat> God capitulating to the will of mankind and the kings of Israel don't save Israel. They lead it to its destruction. But through David, God promises there will come a Messiah. And finally, that Messiah is Jesus. And Jesus, when he is born miraculously of a virgin, and why is that like Adam? Well, most people have two parents. Both Jesus and Adam have one. For Adam, it's God, and for Jesus, it's Mary. And it's so strange to look at these two side by side and, and see how they're both miraculous births. When we would think of Adam, not even as a birth, we would think as Je of Jesus as being God made flesh, and it's so hard to see both of them in that light. But this is God's plan, and that's what it points to. There's a lot of these very weird mythological elements in the Bible, and they don't make a lot of sense on their own. And they're not really meant to make sense, they're meant to be referential. Jesus points us to Adam, Adam points us to Jesus, and all these things are meant to remind us that our goal in life is to get back to that garden where we can walk and talk with God. That vision we finally see at the end of our Bibles in Revelation chapter 22. Yes, I'm killing time trying to get through my concordance here to Revelation chapter 22. Here we go. John tells us, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city, on each side of the river, stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What nations? At the end of Revelation, we assume it's the end of the world, but... If that's true, then there are no nations. And if that's true, then God has made new bodies for all of us. Why would he make them mortal? Once again, we're looking at mythological elements and trying to make sense of them. But this is all happening at the same time. You see, the strangest Thing about Revelation. It's not the multi-headed beasts and the dragons and the weird time scales. The weird thing is to think that it's a message and it's happening all at once. That Revelation isn't some distant, distant future. It is our distant past, but it's also right here and right now. That we of the nations are invited to partake in those leaves of the tree of life to receive the healing that comes through living in the way of Jesus through embodying compassion and justice and forgiving as we are forgiven so if you're wanting to get back to that garden, to walk and talk with God, today is the day to receive healing, to take a dip in that water and be born again in the kingdom.
brothers and sisters, when I was growing up, I was taught that this story was meant to be read literally. That Adam and Eve were a literal couple, and they lived 6,000 years ago, and the earth is probably about that same age, and I didn't believe it then, and I don't believe it now, and I don't think that that's what the Bible is trying to tell us. I believe that when we look at this figuratively, that we find a deeper and more meaningful message, and we find it works on so many levels, and there are themes running through the whole Bible. But if you need, if you're not there yet, if you need to look at this literally, I'd point to the science of it. You see, there's a formula and I'm not going to bother you with mathematical formulas, but there's a formula for determining how long it would take a population to descend from, or today's population, for any two people on Earth to have descended from a single common ancestor. And that works out to be about two to 3,000 years. So just imagine this. You have a family tree, right? You're at the base of it. Imagine that family tree. You are at the base of it, and it branches, right? You have two parents, and each of them have two parents. And as it branches, it branches out, and those branches go wider and wider and wider. Now imagine someone on the other side of the world, and they have a family tree, and they're at the base of it. And they have two parents, and each of them have two parents. And as you go back in time, those branches go wider and wider and wider. And after about two to three thousand years, no matter where those two people are in the world, there will be at least one ancestor that they both have in common. And no matter which two people on earth you pick, that will be true. They will ultimately all have the same ancestor in common, and it only takes about two to three thousand years. So when Paul preached his sermon about Adam and how God worked through Adam's life to establish the nations, to call all the people of the world back into relationship with himself. When Paul preached that sermon, that was true of Moses, who had lived more than 3,000 years earlier. Moses was already a descendant of everyone there. And when Moses lived, it was true of our mythological Adam. For every generation that's ever lived, there has been an Adam. And you don't have to go all the way back to the biblical Adam to get there. Because in as much time as has passed, if there were any person alive in 4000 BC, every person on earth would be descended from them. So there's your literal Adam and Eve. Does the Bible have to be literally true for that? No. Because any person on earth would have been Adam and Eve. And when you read it that way, a whole lot more makes sense in Genesis chapter 4, when Cain is afraid of all the people who might punish him, who might call out for his blood because of what he's done. What people? He just killed the only other person. And the only two people besides him and his brother are his parents. Is he worried about his parents? It makes a whole lot more sense if humanity was already a thing. 
And that gives us our last mythological element, the call. Just as Jesus was called to live his life of ministry, as he went into the desert and was tested by the devil, and he was called all the way to the cross to give his life in place of ours. So too was Adam called. Because Adam is just the word for humanity in Hebrew. That's all it means. And Eve in Hebrew is Hava. Her name means life. Their names are highly symbolic. So, doesn't it seem likely to believe that when it says that God led the human to Eden, why would it be that there was only one human at that time? Did God, just like in every one of these stories I, I've mentioned, call just one human? I don't know if God has been calling to us for 2,000 years or 6,000 years or 150,000 years, but I know God has been calling to us for a long, long time. And I know that God is infinitely patient, that he will give us as long as it takes to get it right. And I know that just as God forgave Adam, so he forgives us. Jesus died to bring about forgiveness. Adam lived for his entire life in that forgiveness, and that is what we're called to do. And just like the Lord's Prayer, may we always forgive as we're forgiven. It's a high bar. But I think God has faith in us. So let's have faith in our God as well. Amen?